April 27th meeting of the Senate Finance Committee will come to order. We have two bills on the agenda. We'll let the record reflect the quorum is present. And we are going to start with Senate File 2, Senator Mann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I am very happy to be here today to present Senate File 2, which will establish Minnesota's paid family and medical leave program. Um, most of you, if not every single person here, has been in another committee where this bill has been presented, so I will try not to repeat myself, but I will say, as I always do, that we are one in seven countries who do not have this program available. Um, and I say that because we have the experience of the rest of the world and 11 other states, and we have um, the, the knowledge uh, to know that this program works. It makes economic sense. It is durable, sustainable, and it's popular. And should we pass this program this year, we will be state 12 or 13. We are competing with other states this year. So again, we have the luxury of learning lessons from those other states. And we know that paid family leave has a myriad of benefits from the mental health of the parents to the physical health of the mother to the physical health of the child. We know that businesses benefit from this program as we have seen in those 11 other states due to decreased loss of productivity and increased employee retention. A program like this impacts gender disparities in the workforce, addresses racial disparities in leave taking, and helps those with disabilities stay in their jobs, among many other things. This will have an economic impact on our long-term care utilization, our health care utilization, and will have a great impact on our child care crisis. In fact, when Europe had a child care crisis, they solved that problem by expanding their paid leave programs. But perhaps most importantly is we know that this program will help families. This helps families not have to choose between taking care of a loved one or keeping their job. It will prevent people from having to hand over their two-week-old baby to someone else to take care of. And this keeps families on their feet during some of the most vulnerable times in their lives. With that, Mr. Chair, we do have one amendment we would like to introduce today. Um, and we also have fiscal staff on hand to walk through the fiscal note, whatever you prefer. Sure. Um, why don't we start, because this is what brings the bill into line with the spreadsheet and everything, the amendment. So Senator Pappas moves the A94 amendment. Discussion on that, could we have a walkthrough of the amendment by either Ms. Uh, I, I can, do you have it? I have just, three. just, I have I know. One. do you have it ready? I'll no, just go from that and then do what you have here. Okay. Because you, I mean, here's the APA for. Okay. I can walk through it, um, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. So um, lines 1.2 to 1.4 are technical changes, changing subdivision titles and things of the sort. 1.5 to 1.13, this changes the definition of covered employment uh, to align with what the business community has recommended to make it easier and better for them. Um, Lines 1.14 to 1.23 clarifies that trades are not considered seasonal employees. 1.24, uh, this reverts our definition back to our original definition of uh, incapacity. This was a technical oversight in the previous committee. Lines 1.25 will change the look back period for self-employed individuals from two years to one year. Uh, again, to make it easier to uh, implement the program. Lines 1.26 will clean up the definition of the um, serious health condition to match that with the rest of the bill. The remainder of page two uh, will add the customary appropriations language uh, and clarifying on 1.29, uh, adding the language to clarify the account. And then uh, it allows the funds not to cancel on 2.1 on to 2.5. And the, keep going back. Yeah, okay. Okay. Then on uh, 2.7 to 2.10, we clarify that intermittent leave benefits are prorated. On 2.12, it removes um, redundant UI language. The rest uh, up until 2.19 is very technical. Uh, 
corrections. 2.2 to 221 clarifies that employer has the flexibility of increasing uh, the percentage as a premium that they choose to offer uh, as a benefit to uh, different employees. Line point two. 2.27 um, adds race and ethnicity as one of the data pieces to be collected. And the rest is the appropriations that we have um, and we can have fiscal staff walk through that. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, for the record, my name is Hannah Grunwald Milner, and I will be walking through this spreadsheet uh, provided in your packets titled Senate File 2, <coughs> Paid Family Medical Leave Insurance, as proposed to be amended. And uh, this spreadsheet is was off of the previous A93 amendment, but the A94 um, is, is similar in substance to the spreadsheet and, uh, and A94. So that title should read uh, as proposed to be amended by the A94 amendment. And the appropriations begin in the amendment on page three, line four, but I'll just read off of the spreadsheet uh, for simplicity. So beginning with line eight, um, the expenditures of the bill, uh, the first expenditure being Department of Commerce for development of private plans and approvals, appropriation of 692,000 in fiscal year 24-25 from the paid family medical leave fund. Um, and then there's an ongoing cost of 256,000 in the tails. On line 12 for the uh, Department of Employment and Economic Development, there's appropriation of 122.297 million in fiscal year 24-25 for the creation development of interface systems and administration. Uh, and there's an ongoing cost of 149.7 million in fiscal year 26-27. On line 14, the benefits uh, calculation from the fiscal note from um, the worker plus model results in a $1.13 billion uh, expenditure in fiscal year 26 and then a $1.19 billion expenditure in fiscal year 27. Um, and those amounts are showing up in the tails because there's an effective date in the bill of uh, July 1st, 2025, um, which would begin in fiscal year 26. On line 17 and 18, there's an appropriation to human services for IT system updates of 2.6 million in the first year, one time. For the Department of Labor and Industry, um, this appropriation is broken down uh, into a few different lines. So beginning on line 23 for investigation FTE costs, there's an appropriation of 607,000 in the first biennium and 1.3 million in the tails. On line 24 for the Office of Administrative Hearings, uh, there's legal fees that the, the Department of Labor and Industry um, will will be giving to the uh, office, and that's 8,000 in fiscal year 24, 25, and um, the same amount ongoing in the tails. For IT costs, there's a one-time appropriation of 240,000 in the first year. There's an ongoing IT user license um, <coughs> cost of 10,000 each year ongoing. For outreach expenditures uh, in the first biennium, it's 100,000, and then in the tails, it's 50,000. On line 31, there's appropriation to the legislature of 18,000, and this would cover payroll system updates. Beginning on line 34 for um, Minnesota management and budget, there's a, uh, this, these, this writer is also broken up into um, a few lines here, although in the, in the amendment, it's just showing the total amount. So that total amount of 118,000 <laughs> in fiscal year 25 covers 40,000 of IT costs, 3,000 of notice posting requirements, and 75,000 of notice acknowledgement requirements. The ongoing cost in the tails uh, of 62,000 is covering the cost due to right to set off requirements, and those requirements um, are explained on page 46 and 47 of the fiscal note. On line 42, for the Secretary of State, there's an appropriation of 388,000 in one-time funding, and this covers IT costs and training. 
On line 46 for the Supreme Court, there's a one-time appropriation uh, of 30,000 for system updates and collections, uh, which would cover IT costs and training. On line 50 for the University of Minnesota, it's a one-time appropriation of 1.3 million uh, in fiscal year 24, and that would cover staffing costs for uh, startup implementation. Um, on line 54 and 55, there's the uh, general fund appropriations for um, fiscal year 26 and 27. This is a total of three million each year, and of that amount, 35,000 is for notice ac acknowledgement requirements, and three million and 14,000 is for costs incurred by state agencies by employer paid premiums. And this, um, Appropriation shows up on page five, line eight of the of the A94, um, and as you can see on line five point thirteen, the Commissioner of Management and Budget shall allocate these amounts to agencies' base budgets based on the expected costs incurred by those agencies. Back to the spreadsheet, on line 59, there's a, another general fund expenditure of 668 million in fiscal year 24 in one-time uh, funding. This is the transfer from the general fund to the paid medical leave fund. Then on the bottom part of the spreadsheet, there shows uh, totals for the general fund and paid medical leave fund on lines 62 and 63. And for the general fund, there's that 668 million in the first year and the six million uh, in, in the tails. And then for paid family medical leave fund uh, in the first biennium, expenditures of 128.5 million. And in the tails, uh, 2.479 billion. And again, that's, that's including um, the benefits paid calculation from deed on line 14. Beginning on line 66, there's some general fund revenues uh, that the fiscal note indicates. So on line 67, there's a, a small revenue from the, the Department of Labor and Industry for um, penalty fee revenue. Most of this is going back to the complainant and not the general fund, so that's why it's showing a little bit lower of a revenue. On line 68, the Secretary of State has some filing fee revenue uh, of 2,000 in the tails. Line 69, the Supreme Court also has some filing fee revenue of 209,000 uh, in fiscal year 26, 27. For the paid family medical leave fund, the revenues and transfers coming in, um, first there's that 668 million and on line 72, and then on line 73, uh, the premium rate revenue coming into the account um, it begins to show up in fiscal year 26 and 27. That's 1.37 billion in the first year and 1.4 billion in the second year. And the net spending line, um, you can see that the general fund uh, total amounts after expenditures and revenues are taken into account, the 668 million still showing up the total in fiscal year 24, and in the tails, um, slightly lower with the revenue taken into account at 5.88 million. And the paid family need Pa paid family medical leave fund line on 78 uh, shows the balances of the account, but the, the negative amount isn't showing that the fund is under, it's showing that there's savings in the account. And it's a little bit easier to explain this if you flip to the second page. Um, this table on the second page is showing the paid family medical leave fund balance throughout fiscal year 24 and fiscal year 27. So on line 84, there's a starting balance of the general fund appropriation of 668 million. Um, there's no revenues in fiscal year 24, 25. Uh, so then the total resources line is just showing that, that first general fund appropriation into the fund. And then on line 88, the total expenditures um, are the total amount of all of the uh, appropriations that I just walked through throughout the agencies on the first page showing a fund balance of 611.985 million in fiscal year 24. That amount is then shown again on line 84 in fiscal year 25, which is the carry, carry forward amount just to show what the balance of the uh, fund is over time. So once revenues and um, 
premiums are being paid in fiscal year 26, 27. You can see that the balances uh, of the fund at the end of fiscal year 26 is 700.7 million, and at the end of fiscal year 27 is 875.4 million. So there's a, a positive balance in the fund, and, and we thought that it was easier to look at it this way instead of that one line which shows um, amounts in parentheses which really indicates that there's a, a positive balance in the fund. So I'll stop there, and if members have any questions, I'm happy to answer any. Questions from members of the committee? Mr. Chair, can I just add one Senator thing? Senator Mann, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just, um, I missed on line point 1.17 of the amendment. We uh, exempted anyone employed covered under the Federal Real Unemployment Insurance Act. This is federal law, and we didn't want to usurp that, but we still, still are having conversations about it, so I just wanted to highlight that. Thank you. The line 1.17 of the amendment. Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Mayor. First of all, thanks for all your incredibly hard work and your engagement. Uh, that always makes it better. I did have some texts from railroad employees wondering about that. Do you mind saying a little bit more about the conversations that you're planning to have going forward? Yes, so we have talked to um, both sides of the people on this particular issue. We have looked at lawsuits in other states because of it. Um, so that's why we included it at this time. I am continuing to talk to the trades and the unions about it to see how we can proceed uh, going forward. Thank you very much, Senator. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Further discussion on the spread or the A94 amendment to put the bill into this shape. Discussion on the amendment, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Ms. Nolner, I'm still somewhat confused by the spreadsheet and I'm hoping you can help me out here. Mm -hmm. So I make a, uh, we're replacing what was in the bill at a $1.7 billion transfer, lowering that to 668 million into the paid family medical leave account. When I look at net spending, um, we seem to subtract out all but what, at least on the, A, on the uh, A93, when I was looking at it last night, it was $586 million in, in spend. There was $886, $586 million in spending to the various agencies. Um, but it doesn't seem to be coming out of the general fund. It doesn't seem to be coming out of the paid family medical leave account, I'm only taking about 50 million out of the paid family medical leave account or 57 million. Can you help me ex help me reconcile where we've got the spending to all the agencies, the general fund spending going into the paid family leave account and why I'm not at a much higher level? Ms. Gutenwald, no uh, Mr. Chair and members and Senator Pratt, I, I believe the, um, the, a93 and the A94 won't have any changes on the spreadsheet. Um, so the, f could you repeat that uh, amount? It was. Thank you. So when when I added up all the expenditures, commerce, deed, human human services, that came up to 586, 587 million, roughly, 586, 996 to be precise, but. Um, and then we have a $668 million transfer from the general fund to the paid family medical leave fund. And I'm trying to reconcile where all the agency spending is going along with being able to keep $611 million in the paid family medical leave fund. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, I guess I'm looking at the spreadsheet, um, line 63 of the expenditure totals, the first two years, so fiscal year 24, 25, um, the 128.5 million, that's the total expenditures of agencies within the A94. Um, there are some parts of the fiscal note that are not covered in the A94, but those are mostly ongoing amounts. Um, all of the startup funding of 128.5 in the in the first biennium is is essentially covered with the 668 million, 
when you, when you're talking about the uh, five five hundred million figure you're referring to, was that over the course of two biennia or? It was it was in the A ninety three amendment. Just as I added them up, maybe I made a mistake, but I didn't think so. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, the A93 or A94 is that's in front of us. This, the amounts in the first year um, are are adding up to the okay. line 63 of this spreadsheet. So it's 128.5 um, million, and I, I believe that first year is also matching what the fiscal note has in the first biennium. So I'm not sure where the 500. Okay. Further discussions of the A94 amendment? Senator Pappas. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to get clear that the, the A94 is the one we have before us. Could you explain again what the A93 is, or was that just a, a misnomer? Because I don't have an A93. Uh, Senator anymore. Pappas, that was an earlier version. They made some changes to it, apparently. And okay, it's, got so it. It's not in front of us. It's okay, got it. And that would have been posted, so that's where people would have seen it. Ms. And Mr. Chair, and uh, Mr. Chair and members, and the A93 and the A94, there were no changes to the appropriations section of either amendment. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, just for a matter of clarity, in some occasions, Senator Pappas, we wanted to avoid some overnight confusion by posting a spreadsheet that was having a spreadsheet posted and uh, that aligned with a particular amendment when a need to change the amendment occurred we didn't want to immediately post another spreadsheet to introduce what we thought might be more confusions. So the spreadsheet conforms to the A94, but there was a new instruction that needed to be added, and thus the A93 turned into the A94. Further discussion on the A94 amendment? Senator Pratt and then Senator Rester. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Mann, um, in your amendment, on line 118, you exclude um, employees working in the construction industry. Can you tell me why we're doing that? Mr. Chair? Yeah, so this um, <clears throat> uh, was done because it's, so it's for the definition of employees and seasonal employees. The construction, the way that the construction trades work is that they go from job to job for short periods of time but they're not considered a seasonal employee, they're considered year-round employees, they just work at different jobs because it's of the nature of the work. And so we wanted to make sure that they were not excluded from the program under the seasonal employee definition. Mr. Chair. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Mann, we have lots of temporary employment agencies that, that work throughout the state. Um, I, I worked with one, uh, in trying to fix the wage theft law that uh, sends nurses out, um, temporary nurses to, to fill slots. And we had a similar problem in that, you know, they, they might be working for uh, Fairview Ridges in Burnsville one day, and then maybe they're working at Park Nicollet in St. Louis Park or Methodist or wherever, right? And it became, why wouldn't we have the same problem with those those types of, of of working people versus what we've got in the construction. They're going from job to job, working for multiple employers. Um, how is that going to work? Mr. Chair? Uh, so we don't have the same problem with those specific examples because one is if you're hired for a position that is known to be for, in our bill, 150 days or less, then you're exempt. The difference is if you're working for an employment company, who hires you year round to go from job to job, then you're technically not employed for a season, you're employed for the whole year, you're just doing different jobs, and that's where the difference lies. Senator Brett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, are construction workers covered under this paragraph now exempt from collecting under paid family medical leave? Mr. Chair, so we added them, um, if you look on page 10, uh, we added them, they're in the definition of employee. We just wanted to clarify that they are part of the program. They are not exempt from paid family leave. I'm sorry, page 10. 
it's under the definition of employee. We want, again, this is just to clarify that they are indeed not exempt from the program. Sir, I'm sorry, go ahead, continue. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I'd make an oral amendment to strike lines 118 through 123 of the amendment. Mr. Chair, it, it, it seems like we've got these folks, as, as I understand Senator Mann's description, um, we are somehow exempting seasonal employees, and I've yet to understand how that's going to how that's going to work. But um, it sounds like we are not collecting premium on um, on construction employees, but yet they are eligible for benefits. That's what I understood. Senator Mr. Chair, your no, I'm, to be. I perhaps you misunderstood. The, we are collecting premiums for construction workers. They are part of the program. They are uh, paying into the program and getting benefits. We are exempting them from the seasonal employee definition. Got it, understood. Okay, thank you. I'll withdraw my amendment. Further discussion, Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Mann, uh, back to the dollars that we were just talking about. Uh, originally there was a billion Five billion seven put into it. Now we're talking uh, more around six hundred million. Uh, what's what's making up the difference? And essentially, uh, uh, are we going to have to collect uh, taxes on the on all employees through their employer and employee contributions sooner and longer before the benefits go into effect? Or how do you uh, reconcile the the difference of what was originally being talked about and now what, what's being proposed. Senator Mann. Mr. Chair, so we initially asked for $1.7 billion that would cover the program for two full years and all operating costs. Uh, it was not necessary, but we just asked for it because why not? So now we got the 668, which is plenty to cover the program for about five to six months and still cover all the operating costs. Uh, we will not need to make up any difference. We will, um, we will continue to go forward as planned with offering the benefit and collecting premiums on the same day. And so we will not need to collect premiums for longer <clears throat> or before the program starts. Excuse me. <coughs> Mr. Chair, um, Senator Mann, what, what, what's the effective date uh, when this all goes into effect, if, if it passes? R Right now, we have it at July 1st, 2025, uh, but we are still having conversations on that date as of today. Further discussion on A94. If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Aye. Motion prevails. On the bill, um, discuss, did you more presentation you want to do of anything that many people have seen the bill? Is there a discussion on the bill or amendments or whatever? Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm curious, Mr. Chair, as we've adopted this amendment, we still have a fiscal note that shows a $1.7 billion general fund expenditure. And I'm just wondering why we don't have an updated fiscal note with the new appropriations. Ms. Grunwald Nogner, you want to address that, or Mr. Nelman? Uh, sure, uh, Mr. Chair and members, Senator Pratt. I believe the only thing that would change in the, in this fiscal note with the amendment uh, would be that 1.7 line. So that would change from 1.7 to 668 million. Um, so there wouldn't be much change, uh, I guess, to the to the existing note for the purposes of of the expenditures. Um, the appropriation would be the only thing that would change. Mr. Nauman. Mr. Chairman, I get to Senator Pratt's point, <clears throat> I apologize, I might be losing my voice a little this morning. Um, if you flip to the second page of Ms. Nolner's spreadsheet, the starting balance on line 84, if Senator, um, to Senator Pratt's question, if 1.7 had been provided, then the transfer would be that much larger, creating large, larger balances. If I understand the answer correctly, there, there aren't 
significant spending changes, there might be some adjustments of spending that the author may not have chosen to pick up. Um, but I don't think they're large in dollar value. I'm not I'm taking the verbal cues that I'm right on that. So the, the I think the primary difference is that the fund balance on line 90 would be larger had the balance, had the initial transfer been larger. So I hope Brett. that helps, Senator Brown. Thank you. Yeah. Senator Jayheim. Thank you, Chair. Um, is, is there any way we could just maybe go through and the fiscal note just real quick, um, you know, like on page one, um, I assume that 1.7 under general fund now should read 668. Is that the right assumption there? Ms. Can we Can we just maybe just a couple of the pages kind of go through that so we have the right numbers at least on the on the fiscal note, if that wouldn't take too long. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, certainly, yes, I can walk through um, kind of the big picture of the fiscal note, and then if there's more questions, we can go into detail. I think the easiest place to start would be on page four of the fiscal note. Um, four and five just show the breakout of expenditures and revenues, um, and it's a little bit easier to walk through. So the very first, uh, table here on page four are the net totals. Um, and I can walk through these and just mention uh, when there's revenues and what is included in, in the expenditures. So beginning with admin hearings, um, this agency has a net zero cost. This is because uh, the Department of Labor Administration um, there's a appropriation in the bill and an expenditure in the fiscal note of uh, 4,000 a year to the Office of Administrative Hearings. Um, so that's covering the expense that admin is, uh, is, is uh, noting in their fiscal note. So there's a, and then there's also a, a charge from deed for rulemaking and that also nets out with the expenditures in the, in the fiscal note and in the bill. For the Commerce Department, um, this amount is the same that is in the A94, um, and this is covering private plan product reviews, FTEs, and uh, in, in the fiscal note, it's showing a general fund impact, and that's just how the fiscal note is assuming um, appropriations. In the A94, and the Senate file two as amended, um, the, there's direct appropriations <laughs> from the paid family leave uh, fund to the Commerce Department to cover these costs. And we adjusted the account language to allow for that. So the fiscal note is showing a general fund impact, but in the bill, it is coming from the paid family leave fund. For the Department of Employment and Economic Development, um, that's, this is where the 1.7 billion in general fund appropriation shows up. And uh, as, as we've been talking about, this would instead show 668 million as a general fund impact um, and that paid family leave line would mirror what is in the spreadsheet um, on line 78 of the first page. So uh, a balance of 611.985 million in, uh, in paid family leave. And that includes things outside of deed. So I don't know the exact uh, deed amount there. But for fiscal year 25 and uh, the years following that, the expenditures are covered in the Senate file two as amended. And um, fiscal year 26 and 27 are showing the balance between uh, expenditures and revenues. So the expenditures would include um, benefits paid calculation from the worker plus model admin, IT, and, and the business subsidy program. And then the revenue um, that offsets that is coming in from employer premium starting in fiscal year 26, 27. For the human services department, um, the, appropriate, the expenditure in the fiscal note is covering IT systems updating in the first year. And then there's an ongoing amount for that in fiscal year 26 and 27, as well as um, impact on nursing home reimbursements in fiscal year 27. And those amounts uh, in the tails are not included in the uh, Senate file two as amended, 
a lot of the ongoing costs um, were, were taken out of, of the amendment and only costs that were tied uh, directly to the program, so from the Department of Labor, Department of Commerce, um, and Department of Employment and Economic Development, those on ongoing costs were kept. For Labor and Industry Department, um, this has a, in the fiscal note shows a general fund and paid fa family medical leave split, uh, but in the Senate file two as amended, this is all coming from the paid family medical leave account. And similar reasons to um, what I was talking about earlier with the fiscal note assuming a certain split between the two funds, but we're making direct appropriations in Senate file two uh, directly from the fund. So the 601, um, in fiscal year 24 and 374 in fiscal year 25 and 731 ongoing in fiscal year 26, 27. Those are all included in Senate file two as amended. And those amounts include uh, investigation FTE cost, IT cost, um, office of admin hearing, legal fees, outreach, and IT user license cost. And uh, again, there's some revenue here coming in from penalty fees. For the legislature, uh, in fiscal year 25, there's 18,000 uh, of a cost for updating a payroll system, and that co cost is covered in the Senate, in Senate file two as amended. Um, and the ongoing costs are the employer premiums that the legislature is, um, is saying how much will cost them as an employer. The Metropolitan Council, uh, the 8.9 million in fiscal year 26 and the 9.36 million in fiscal year 27 are the cost, uh, the premium costs to the Met Council as an employer. And um, this provides the totality of costs to the entity. Um, and much of the cost for Met Council could fall into other funding sources like federal or, or local funds. Uh, but for the purposes of the fiscal note, um, the LBO thought it best to show these costs all coming from the general fund uh, to just show the totality of the cost to the Met Council. And local and federal funds um, are not available to agencies in the fiscal note tracking system, which is the software that agencies use to produce notes. Um, another thing to note with the Met Council amount is that they assume 15% of their employees would take leave. Um, and this, this percentage is uh, a little bit different than other agencies' assumptions. Um, and the assumption here is based on the current actual leave taken uh, at the Met Council. Senator, Senator Dreheim. So on, on the 15 percent, so mm -hmm. they are currently offering a, a program right now through the Met Council, and, and their use rate is 15 percent? Is that, is that what you said? Uh, Mr. Chair and members, I don't know the specifics of their offerings. Um, I just know that their assumption was based on their current practices. So if that current leave is uh, paid family leave, I assume they're offering um, some sort of paid family leave that they're using that assumption for. I'd have to look into the details of the fiscal note, um, but off the top of my head, that's, that's my understanding. Thank you. Please continue. So, Mr. Chair and members, next would be the Minnesota Management and Budget Department. Um, this is showing a split between the general fund and all other funds. Uh, and the M M MMB in the fiscal note is um, being shown as an employer, which is covering all state agencies except for the legislature and the University of Minnesota. Uh, so, Minnesota state pre premiums are included in this estimate. And it is split between the general fund and all other state funds because not all state agencies are going to have their paychecks coming from the general fund. So there's a 34, 67, 65% split between the general fund and all other funds. And this amount shown here includes um, the premiums paid, uh, IT costs for startup, other costs like notices, backfill costs, and cost savings of benefits paid by the employer. Then under Minnesota State, like I said, the premiums for Minnesota State are covered under MMB. So this amount is showing um, the backfill amount that they are um, noting to uh, replace employees taking leave. And um, 
they assume that employees will take their employer provided benefit along with the paid family medical leave in the bill. And because of this, Min State is not showing savings uh, for, for, to offset that, um, where other agencies in the note do have that assumption that um, they'll have some savings. Minnesota State is not showing savings. And this is similar to MMB's assumption on page 50, uh, which is only accounting for savings realized from 24-7 employees. For the Secretary of State, um, the 384,000 in fiscal year 24 and the 4,000 in fiscal year 25 are covered under Senate File 2 as amended. And these costs cover IT and um, IT costs for collecting, for adding new lien and uh, a new lien to the lien filing system. And there is also some filing fee revenue here. The ongoing amount of 76,000 a year is 20% uh, of the maintenance of this first, of the first setup startup costs. Um, and like I said earlier, uh, the ongoing costs for agencies, if they're not tied directly to the program, like DEED, Department of Labor and Commerce, they're not included in Senate File 2. For the Supreme Court, the 15,000 in fiscal year 24 and 15,000 in fiscal year 25 are covering uh, the technology costs, and that's one time. And the Supreme Court is assuming that they would need um, one judge unit FTE for private cause of action and tax collection cases increasing. Um, and that amount is, uh, is noted in the fiscal note, but is not covered in Senate File 2. There's also some revenue coming in to the Supreme Court for appellate court and district court case filings. So then finally, the University of Minnesota, the 1.37 million in fiscal year 25 is covered in the bill. And in the fiscal note, um, it is including technology costs of startup and implementation. And the tails, uh, the 195,000 each year is uh, accounting for um, for ongoing maintenance costs and also the premium cost uh, that the U University of Minnesota is assuming. They are assuming um, an employer premium of 0.35% as the bill directs. And this also includes um, replacement costs and uh, cost avoided or savings based on uh, employers taking leave. So like the Met Council, um, similar to the Met Council, the U may have other funding sources than the state amount um, to account for their wages. So this amount that the university is noting is the entire cost of, of the wages of the system um, and not necessarily just the state budget um, amount. So I'll, I'll end there. Um, and if, if members have any questions, I'm happy to go into more detail um, on each agency if needed. Senator Pratt. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Nolder, I'm, I'm just a little bit confused. So we're appropriating $118 million to MMB to cover all the state agencies, including Minnesota State. And we have to give $1.3 billion to the University of or I'm, oh, I'm sorry, these aren't in thousands, my mistake. I'm so used to looking at the spreadsheets in thousands. Yeah. But why is the University of Minnesota so much higher than all of state government uh, <clears throat> combined? 118,000 to cover the expense for all the state agencies, including Minnesota State, and 1.3 million for the University of Minnesota just alone. I mean, I, I'm trying to scan through the, the fiscal note here quickly, but maybe you already know that answer and can save me some time. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, Senator Pratt, the um, 118,000 for MMB and then the 1.3 million for the University of Minnesota are only covering the startup cost uh, to implement the program. And the university's amount, um, if you turn to page 72, so this very the second to last page of the fiscal note, um, Table four implementation costs are showing uh, the amounts that the University of Minnesota is saying they would need um, in that first year to set up. So the, the table flows over to page 73, um, 
so you can see the total of 1.3 million listed there. And again, this is uh, accounting for the entire system of the University of Minnesota, so it's showing the entire costs. Um, but uh, similar to the Met Council, where there there may be other funds that the university can um, that are available to the university, there the state appropriations to the university only make up so much of their budget. Um, so this is this is the 1.3 um, is accounting for what what it would cost for the entire system um, to implement this. So hypothetically, you know, this amount could be lowered if, uh, if we were to equal it to the amount of money that the state is uh, giving to the university. Sir Brett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'll be honest with you. Um, you know, Minnesota State is as big, if not bigger, Senator Dreheim, than, you know, the University of Minnesota. We seem to... Is, is the anticipation then, or can, is it reasonable to assume that Minnesota State's passing those costs on to students? Uh, Mr. Chair and members, I'm not entirely sure if, um, if Minnesota State clarified that those implementation costs would be absorbed. It, it seems to me that they didn't list any need for additional FTEs. Um, so if there were costs uh, to the Minnesota State systems, they didn't report that in the fiscal note, to my understanding. Um, so the implementation, there wouldn't be any implementation costs for the system. And MMB would be, um, because Minnesota State is under MMB's fiscal note, any implementation costs that the Minnesota State system would have, um, I believe would be assumed in the, in the MMB note. For 118,000. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, the, that's correct. The Minnesota Management and Budget appropriation for startup costs um, is 118,000. <coughs> and uh, Mr. Chair and members, um, <coughs> just to clarify, uh, to correct a statement I said earlier, they are not covered in the, um, the startup for Minnesota State is uh, not covered in the MMB note, but they do use the same system as the state does. And the University of Minnesota has their own system um, for, for, for payroll. So that might be why um, the University of Minnesota's fiscal note is uh, assuming a larger cost. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Noldner, I, I, your last point I just want to kind of <coughs> touch base on. So there's 118,000 system-wide for all of state government. And <clears throat> now I'm hearing that the startup costs for Minnesota State aren't a part of the MMB calculation? Mr. Chair and members, Senator Pratt, <coughs> yes, you're correct. And it's my understanding that in Minnesota State's portion of the fiscal note, um, which begins on page 54. I, unless I'm mistaken, I don't believe that they are um, mentioning any sort of startup costs. Um, I'd have to review it a little bit more in detail, but I don't believe that they're saying there's gonna be any sort of startup cost to the system. And if, Oh, actually, I just did see on page 56 at the very top of the page, um, Minnesota State would have increased costs for data and managerial op obligations required by this program, but they're assuming that that will be absorbed. Well, Mr. Chair, my, my fear is <clears throat> my fear is that's going to be passed along and in, in to to students and tuition increases. I I, I don't know that. Minnesota State has extra money to to absorb a lot of these costs. Um, Senator Pappas on that. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm just wondering if it's already in their agreement, um, their collective bargaining agreement. When I'm looking at page 56, what caught my eye is that they already have it up to six weeks at full salary. So if this is 12 weeks at partial reduced salary, um, it might be just a wash. So maybe that's the situation, I'm guessing. Yeah, maybe. 
Senator Pratt, will you? Oh, send Mr. Nauman to come. Mr. Chair, um, at the risk of getting in the middle of this conversation, I'll, I'll maybe try to distill a couple of distinctions here. I think you've been talking about the benefits and the startup costs as two separate data points. As um, the committee is well aware, the University of Minnesota has its separate payroll and HR policies um, that are distinct from the state system. And so I think what you're seeing is a higher startup cost to get that system up and running, whereas Min State is using the state system and they can lean on the, um, the work that MMB is doing for the startup costs. To Senator Pappas point, Pappas's point, I am not the expert about what is in the, the benefit set for Minnesota State um, employees, and others could answer that question. Further discussion, Senator Dreheim. Thank you, Chair. Marty, um, I, I had some questions on the fiscal note, um, and, and I know we, I think we've talked about this before, and I was hoping that Senator Wicklin would have been here. Um, but on the bottom of page 24, uh, uh, under section 37, um, it talks about medical uh, assistance reimbursement rates. Um, and they talk about the inability to implement or predict for uh, a segment of direct care workers. And I was just wondering how that was addressed in the fiscal note, because that is a, a huge, huge, huge cost to the state, um, that segment of workers. So how, can you just kind of go over how that was calculated um, or how it's reflected in the fiscal note? Mr. Chair. Senator Mann. Uh, so that part was removed from the bill, <clears throat> so it's um, no longer relevant in this fiscal note. So the, the direct care workers aren't covered anymore? No, so what happened is the language that we had in the bill was unworkable, um, and it was, yeah, according to MDH, the, the goal of covering those premiums was not reflected in the language. So we took it out of the bill with this last amendment, um, and we are having continued conversations about what that language actually has to look like for it to accomplish that goal. So as of right now, it is not in the bill. Chair? Senator Jayheim. So can, can someone show me then where it's reflected in the fiscal note? I mean, we because we it's billions of dollars that we're spending on, on that segment, and, and there should be a big fiscal impact. So can someone show me where that's at? Ms. Grunwald, no. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, Senator Dreheim, the impacts um, on page 24 that DHS is discussing, uh, because there were parts of the language that to DHS's understanding was un unimplementable. Um, they didn't have necessarily a, a, a hard number that they can put into the fiscal note. Um, so for the purposes of, of completing the fiscal note, um, the DHS was directed to submit the fiscal note without those costs um, and to indicate in the narrative of the fiscal note that there are these unknown costs um, because because this section of the bill was unimplementable. Mr. Nauman. So, Mr. Chair and Senator Draham, oh. under the fiscal note law, agencies are required to complete a fiscal note, as you all know. Um, but agencies may also choose to comment on a material defect in the bill, essentially saying, as DHS has done in this particular circumstance, the language could not be implemented for a variety of reasons, and in that paragraph they identify what those reasons are. It's then left to the legislature to decide what it chooses to do in response to that response from the agency. And in this case, the author has selected to remove that provision as she's indicated and have a further conversation about that item later. So, further Chair. discussion. Chair. Senator Jayhead. Thank you. So um, the, the fiscal staff feels confident that there is the sufficient cost identified to cover these workers in the, in the fiscal note? 
Um, Mr. 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 Chair and Senator Draham, I think that's further than what fiscal staff was, that what I just indicated to you. Um, I, I appreciate that, um, that point. I don't think that um, the testimony in front of you today indicates that there is not a cost or that it, it wouldn't exist. Instead, that the author has chosen to remove that requirement from the bill not that the costs then go away necessarily, but more that uh, a further conversation will be required to figure out um, what the, the best approach is, best being in the eye of the beholder. I think in this circumstance, the costs exist. Uh, they're not being remunerated in the bill that lies before you today, or they're not being, number one, fully identified, nor are they being paid for in this circumstance. Ms. Gunwell, no. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, and just to point out, um, on page 27 of the fiscal note, uh, the department did indicate a table that is not included in the overall total of the fiscal note, but this table um, are the, are, is an estimate from various long-term care services um, based on technical assistance. Uh, provided by the department to clarify the intent of section 37, but because the department was not sure um, if section 37 were to include the scope of the services listed, um, the scope may be larger than what is being indicated in the table. So the, they do discuss the costs, it's just um, not, a, not a certain number, so it's not being reflected in the fiscal note. Senator Draheim. I, I, I have a real problem with us moving forward without um, having it. I mean, this is a large payroll. Um, you know, I've had bills in the past just to, to give this segment just a fraction of a percent of increase in pay, and it always got killed by the fiscal note. And, and here we have a fiscal note for a, a new payroll tax, and the state obligation we're ignoring. And, and I think we have to to figure this out before we move to the floor. Um, so I, I, I think it needs to go back to committee. Um, and, and we need to at least understand this. I mean, this is the last stop before we go to the floor. And uh, I, I think it's incomplete. I don't know what Senator, thoughts on that, uh, Chair? Mr. Chair, um, so there is no state obligation to pay these wages. These are private companies. Uh, it has, doesn't fall on the state. Well, we had originally put that language in because we wanted to take on that responsibility. Uh, but again, the language that was put in, unfortunately, was unimplementable. And so we're having continued conversations about that. And also, uh, we wanted to make sure that if we do do that, which again, it's not our responsibility to do, but if we did do it, that we would want it to come out of the paid family leave fund. Um, and so that's why we have ongoing conversations about it. But it, should, it doesn't impact the fiscal note because it's not a state obligation. Senator Dame. These are the reimbursement rates. So right now you're taking it out of the bill, <clears throat> and so there would be no coverage for the direct care workers as far as the state paying any of the premiums. Is that what I'm hearing? Senator Mann. Mr. Chair. Unless these companies have 30 or less employees, then we have a premium repayment program in the bill. So I'll ask my question. Senator again. Dames. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The direct care workers, you're, you're taking them out of the bill because we don't know what it's going to cost. Is that what I'm hearing? Mr. Chair, um, n not necessarily. We have an idea of what it's going to cost. It's just the language as it was implemented into the bill was, it was unworkable. And so we took that language out. We are having continued conversations to see what that language can look like to make it so that we can pay for all the premiums uh, because that is something we are choosing to do in this bill. Uh, but again, we're just trying to get the language worked out so it has the impact that we intended. So when do you expect that language? Um, I'm not quite sure yet. But you're going to go ahead and move the bill through the process. And eventually Senator James, your microphone is not on, apparently. Thank you. So we're going to go through the process. We're going to move the bill through. You're hoping to move it out of here today, and I'm assuming the next stop is to the floor. Are you going to take it up on the floor before you have this information? 
No, so uh, Mr. Chair, so again, we put this in the bill because this is something we wanted to do. It's not something we have to do. And we took it out of the bill because the language doesn't work. And so we're gonna likely work on it in conference committee or really over the next two years before the program starts to see if this is something we can implement. You mentioned that you had an idea what the cost would be. What is the cost that you think it's gonna be? Mr. Chair and members, Senator Dames, the fiscal note on page 27 and 28, um, the estimate that DHS is, is giving in, in here is um, 19 million in fiscal year 24, 25, and uh, 38 million in 26, 27. Um, and again, the department uh, wasn't clear on the scope of services included in section 37. So the scope could be larger than the services listed in the table and the totals that I just said. Um, but because of that, the full amount is not being reflected in the fiscal note. But again, on page 28, the totals um, that the DHS is reporting uh, is 19 million, 24, 25, and 30, 38 million and 26, 27. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, I would agree with the Senator Draheim. This bill is not ready to be moved forward till we get that information. Further discussion? Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think based on this discussion, Mr. Chair, I move that um, Senate File 2 be referred to the, the Committee on Human Services without recommendation. Uh, and I request a roll call and under section uh, uh, Senate rule 1210 for the record of the roll call to be printed in the Senate journal and then I'd explain my rationale. I'm assuming there are three hands so. Um, Senator um, Pratt, why don't you go ahead and explain whatever you wanted to explain. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, as Senator Mann said, the, the A94 amendment uh, deletes the language that was added by the Human Services Committee and they felt that it was important enough to put that into the bill. Um, as I understand the discussion here, we are um, putting a, a new obligation onto direct care providers that rely on MA, Medicare, uh, public assistance that um, that will now have to absorb those costs without getting any additional reimbursement. Quite honestly, Mr. Chair, I think the language that Senator Mann is talking about that's going to be worked out has to be worked out in the Human Services Committee. And to say that we're going to work it out before it gets to the floor or we're going to be work, or we're going to work it out when it's in conference committee, or we're going to work it out over the next two years, is not a transparent process. It's not transparent for us in the legislature. It's not transparent to the employers. They're going to have to implement this new program and absorb these new costs, and it's not fair to working taxpaying Minnesotans that are asked to have these funds taken out of their paychecks, particularly those that we're asking to do some of the, the hardest jobs for our most vulnerable Minnesotans. Um, so I think, uh, Mr. Chair, we have, to, we have to send this back to the Human Services Committee and let's work out the language in, in public, not behind the scenes in some back room. Senator Mann. Mr. Chair. So again, this is not a state requirement. We could have said we're gonna pay the premium for everyone over the age of 30 in this bill. And if the language didn't work, we'd have to take out that language. It's not, it doesn't change the scope of the bill. It doesn't change what the bill does. It doesn't take back any of our responsibilities. Um, and on top of that, I have spoken to members of that committee, specifically the amendment author, to discuss how the language can't be worked as it's written. Um, and they understand that we had to take it out because of that and continue to work on it. Uh, but again, this doesn't change anything of the bill, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I understand that, Senator Mann. It's just that if we're going to work out the language, we have a committee process to work out the language in, in a public meeting. 
not not in a, not in a conference room um, outside the public eye. And that's the point that I'm trying to make, is that if this language needs to be amended, as you've said, on multiple occasions, and that we're gonna then, and it was important enough of a concept to be added in to the, um, by the Human Services Committee, then uh, it ought to go back to the Human Services Committee and let's let the committee say, yes, we agree with taking out the language if, if the committee were to act in that fashion, Mr. Chair, then, then we wouldn't have an argument here. But the fact of the matter is the committee put the language in the bill. They felt it was an important enough topic to raise it forward. We are stripping out the policy decision of that committee. And it ought to go back to that committee for ratification so that we have an open and honest process that's transparent to all Minnesotans. So I would encourage a yes vote on the motion to refer. Senator Mann. Mr. Chair, um, so again, because this doesn't change the bill um, and our responsibilities to the bill, what we have talked to, again, with the author of the amendment um, and with other members of the committee, is to work on this as a separate piece of legislation. It will go through all the committee hearings. It will be talked about in public. Um, if and when we get to that point. Uh, nothing will be done in the back room. I've never done anything in the back room when it comes to my bills, um, so I don't foresee that happening this time either. Further discuss, Senator, um, Senator Deems. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Chair, you've been here longer than I have, and I've been around for a while. And, you know, the pride of the Minnesota legislature has always been to get bills ready, get them in the shape we want them before we put them on the floor to pass them. And unfortunately, this year, things have seemed to change a lot. It seems like we throw a lot of the rules out the window and we just move forward. And we really need to start paying attention to the way we do business around here. And this is another case. Uh, this does have a major impact. This will have a major impact on a lot of our nursing homes in, in those situations. And so we're saying here, well, it's not our obligation. Well, it may not be our obligation, but obviously it's important enough that it was in the bill. And so I really think this bill has to be uh, slowed down and get this stuff taken care of and do the bill the right way and do it the way we as Minnesota legislatures do things. We get it taken care of and then we put the bill on the floor and let it go from there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Draheim. Thank you, I just wanted to speak to the motion real quick. Uh, I, I guess I look at all the closings in, in the nursing homes and uh, uh, the, the tough time they're having hiring employees. And then we're gonna put a, uh, an additional tax uh, on their employees that they're having a hard time hiring in the first place. Um, and, and the committee thought it was important enough to amend it, bipartisanly supported and put on the bill. And if it needs work, I understand that. The least, or the minimum we can do with three weeks left, we have plenty of time, send it back to committee. And if it comes out of committee with no changes, I can accept that but I, I think we owe it just to go through the process of sending it back to that committee. It's obviously a very important bill. Um, Senate file two is a high priority for the majority. Um, I think if we're gonna do it, once again, we should do it right. And, and I think this, uh, we can call a committee hearing and, and have it done within today yet probably. So I, I just support the motion and urge a yes vote. Senator Draheim, the, the bill nursing home employees, it's easier to recruit employees if they know they can take leave when they need to. I think that we're, we're talking about, you're talking about once. There, there is a cost, Senator Draheim, and, and this bill is taken care of setting up the system and collecting the premiums and everything else that start in two years, and as Senator Mann indicated, and I think there's strong bipartisan support for, we wanna make sure that 
direct caregivers have, the agencies have the funds they need to pay them, and there's very strong interest in that, and that this doesn't, this bill works as it is. And, and Senator Mann has indicated she wants to do more than that, and I think um, this provision that the committee had put on indicates that there's bipartisan support for doing more than that. I don't see why that should change this bill and the status of this bill at this point, but I'd urge a no vote, but um, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, Mr. Chair, as I mentioned on another bill, I am an unpaid uh, director on the board of a local um, nursing home and long-term care facility. And we are struggling to recruit people to fill our positions. Quite honestly, Mr. Chair, part of the reason we're having a hard time recruiting is all of the state mandates that come down on us and all of the cost on us that we can't afford to pay our people what it takes to recruit them. And adding in a new state mandate like this will not help us recruit. So if you want to do us a favor, Mr. Chair, let's not pass this. Let's send it back to Human Services and get it right because you're not helping our nursing home and long-term care by putting on a new mandate and not helping to cover the cost. And I would say that we should be looking at all of the employment <coughs> regulations that we're putting on these things going forward, whether it's earned sick and safe time, whether it's paid family medical leave, uh, and all of the other mandates that we've been talking about. Mr. Chair, please, I would ask the, I would ask the majority, please stop helping us the way you are. On Senator Pratt's motion that Senate File 2 be referred without recommendation to the Committee on Human Services. Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, uh, to kind of continue the concern here, um, Mr. Chair, we, we don't have to go any further as a committee to know we should support this. Uh, Senator Mann was very honest with us, and she said they don't have it figured out yet. That's all we need to know as a committee, that this bill is not ready. They're still working on figuring these things out, as the author honestly told us. And so I, I don't know why our committee would try to overstep things and ignore the committee process. Uh, Senator Mann's been very forthright with us. We know it's not ready. And so we are compelled as a committee to wait until things are ready to move. And so I would urge people to vote, yes, let's put the clutch in, uh, decide how we're going to go through the muddy ditch and, and not, not get stuck and, and do the committee work. And so the, the author of the, the bill sat here right minutes ago and told us they're still not sure how they're going to figure it out. They're, they're, they're trying to figure it out, but it's not ready. Senator Mann. Mr. Chair, I just want to correct a few things. Uh, number one, uh, Senator Pratt said that we can't recruit people uh, because of programs like this, and that is wildly incorrect. In fact, recent surveys have been done, and 61% of adults who say they plan to move in the next two years pick pay family leave as one of the things they look for when they pick a state to move to. So if you want to recruit people and get workers in Minnesota, this is a fantastic way to do it. And also to Senator Rustrum's point, I did not say that the bill was not ready. The bill is more than ready. We've been through nine committees. The bill's been around for 10 years. We've taken innumerable meetings and spent innumerable hours on this bill, the bill is ready. What we are trying to do is go above and beyond what's in the bill to provide even more securities and provisions for more people. And we can do that as time goes in, but today the bill is absolutely ready. On Senator Pratt's motion. Mr. Chair. Senator Thank you. Pratt. Mr. Chair, well, since Senator Mann misquoted me, I'd like to, I'd like to restate my quote. I, what I've said is that it is state mandates in general, not particularly this one, standalone, but state mandates in general, employment mandates in general that are raising the cost of providing services without adequate uh, reimbursement from the state that is causing us to be to find a difficult time to hire. We would rather put some money on to, we already have programs to meet our employee needs at the, at the facility that I work at because we understand that it's important for retention. I don't need the state to come in and tell me that my benefit is inadequate when I'm trying to balance what I put on the, on the hourly wage and bottom line of the paycheck versus um, what I have to pay into the state into an additional payroll tax. And so I'm asking you to give, you know, quite honestly, my organization the flexibility to decide what's right for our employees, not a one-size-fits-all. But that's beside the point 
on the issue of the amendment where we are stripping out an important piece of policy that was added by a committee and um, it needs to go back to that committee for the work that Senator Mann has said needs to be done either between now on the floor, which won't have a public hearing, in conference committee, which may or may not, depending on, on how it's run, be as public as, as it needs to be, or over the next two years, which continues to add uncertainty to this entire program. So it needs to go back to the Human Services Committee, and uh, thank you for allowing me to uh, correct the record on that. Thank you. On Senator Pratt's motion that Senate File 2 uh, be referred without recommendation to the Committee on Human Services, the roll call has been requested. Staff will take the roll. Chair Marty? No. Senator Friends? No. Senator Pratt? Yes. Senator Champion? No. Senator Dames? Yes. Senator Dreheim? Yes. Senator Eichhorn? Yes. Senator Mohammed? No. Senator Murphy? No. Nope. Senator Pappas? No. Senator Westrom? Yes. Senator Wickland? No. There being five yes and seven no votes, the motion does not prevail. On the bill, as amended, further discussion? If not, Senator Muhammad. Um, Go ahead, Senator, Senator Muhammad, if you want to. Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Mann. I'm going to be a yes vote on sending this to the floor, and I'm going to tell you why. Um, you've been open to discussions, you've listened to all the groups of Minnesotans, and I know there's more work to do, and I am positive that you're the person to do it. I also want to, you know, just point out for the members, there's a group of Minnesotans that hasn't testified here yet and hasn't been a part of the committee process because they don't exist yet, but I believe they're going to, and that's the group of Minnesotans that are going to get this paid time off, including a mother with an infant or a family member who's going to care for that family member. And they'll be coming forward soon to say how much they appreciate the benefits that are provided. And while I have my own questions as a business owner, I think we have to factor in those Minnesotans because they're real, they exist in other places, and they're part of this equation. It's just that they have not yet got the benefit of the bill. And so um, with my certainty that you're going to be a great author and open to some of the discussions between now and the floor when the bill can be amended, if a majority of members want it to be amended, and the conference committee, I look forward to a yes vote. And again, want to thank you and the staff and the stakeholders and everybody that's worked on it. Thank you, Senator Mann, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Further discussion? Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. When this was in front of jobs, I, I'm going to repeat some of... Uh, what we discussed. Senator Mann said this bill has been around for 10 years and it's time to pass it. It's been around 10 years because it's not ready to be passed and it's still not ready to be passed. Uh, we passed off the Senate floor a different version of paid family medical leave, recognizing the fact that the reason our small businesses can't compete with our large businesses that can afford to self-insure is because we have a prohibition at the state level that won't allow family leave policies to be written. And the bill we passed off with tripartisan support removed that restriction and allowed us to go in a way that would allow employers and employees to choose. I may have a kid that works at Valley Fair, a 16-year-old kid, may not need paid family or medical leave. I may have a 17-year-old working in a local restaurant year-round, may not need paid family or medical leave. We already have employers that are meeting the needs of their employees, like the one I mentioned that I, that where I serve on the board as, a, as an unpaid director that is designed to program that meets the needs of our employees. We saw here that Minnesota State already has a program that pays six weeks at 100% of pay, and now we're saying, nope, that's not good enough. You have to pay 12 weeks at 50%. Do we really know that that's what those employees want? They negotiated for the benefit they have. We have other states 
that have taken a far different approach on how to implement this bill, how to implement this benefit, I should say. I don't think the argument is whether or not Minnesotans should have an opportunity for, for paid time off. It's, it's not an issue of whether or not they should get family leave for, for some of the very worthy things that Senator Mann has laid out for the rationale of pushing her bill. Instead, we have taken the example of Washington as the most extreme case and probably one of the most flawed cases that we've seen. The state of Washington came in and they had to double their premium to make the program work and it was effectively two years late in being rolled out because of all the problems they have. Whereas other states like New York have taken a more public-private partnership approach. So let's not kid ourselves. Let's not buy into the gaslighting that's going to say Republicans are against working families having access to these programs. Because we passed a bill. We passed a bill that allowed every work, working Minnesotan the opportunity to participate. We did give them a choice on whether or not they wanted to because quite honestly, I don't know that every Minnesotan wants to participate. We set up a program that was more of a public-private partnership. And it passed again with tripartisan support that never got, a, never got a hearing in the House. So let's not kid ourselves by saying this thing has been around for 10 years and it has to pass the way it is because we've been working on it. It's still not right and there are still other ideas that aren't being considered. And I'll be voting against the bill because I'm very disappointed that the other side has been unwilling to look at any other ideas other than a full and complete takeover of this entire system and putting the Minnesota taxpayer at risk. And, and let me just explain that. We've been told on many occasions we've modeled this against the unemployment system. Well, Mr. Chair, last year we just paid off a $2 billion bill for the unemployment system because of how the demand for benefits exceeded what we had in reserve. We had to borrow from the federal government. We can't borrow from the federal government on this program. If it is under reserve to pay benefits, it falls squarely on the Minnesota taxpayer. Had we taken the approach that Senator Coleman passed, that risk would be off the taxpayer and onto the provider. Senator Mann, this, this bill could have been around for 20 years. It's still the wrong approach. It's still not ready to be passed, and I'll be voting no. Senator Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Senator Mann, uh, for what is an incredible amount of effort that you've put into bringing this bill to this point. And because our offices are close together, I am crystal clear about how much time and effort, how many amendments, how many changes you have made to the proposal. And if you choose to, you should speak to that. Um, but I, uh, I appreciate uh, impeccable legislating, and I see it, and I'm grateful. I, uh, I am the mom of twins, uh, and when we had our girls, uh, Joe, my husband Joe, who's a small business owner, his business was still pretty young. It's in its first decade. He's a painter. He, he paints houses for a living. Um, and so having twins when you don't expect to have twins... Um, and having to, uh, you know, bear all of what happens when you have a new baby uh, without paid leave uh, was a real challenge uh, because he had to work. And taking care of two infants on my own was a real struggle. Um, and I was grateful for the time that I had that was paid. 
uh, but a lot of my time wasn't paid, and Joe and I probably have never fully recovered from that experience and what it meant for us um, and how it strained us. Um, when uh, my mom was diagnosed at the end of her life, she lived for about 11 months after her diagnosis, and my employer at the time, they didn't say, take the time you need, um, and we're going to pay you, but they did say, take the time you need, your job will be safe, and I had uh, sick, t sick time, and I took time without pay to care for her. She lived for about, she lived about five hours from me, um, and she wanted me, her oldest daughter, there with her. So I spent a lot of time with her, and it is one of the treasures of my life that I was there with her for those 11 months. And in both of those cases, paid family leave would have helped my family and would have helped me as a worker and would have helped my employer uh, in both of those cases. And I know that uh, you have heard countless, you've heard countless stories like this. And this is the story of our lives as we go through our lives, um, sick family members, new babies, sick ourselves, et cetera. Um, it is really important that we are making this, this progress for the people of Minnesota. It's important for our workplaces. It's important for our families. It's important for ourselves. Um, and so I just want to thank you um, for everything that you're doing. I know how many times you've made compromises um, in order to move the bill through this process. And I am excited to vote for it um, and know that you are going to continue to work to make it the strongest policy possible for the people of Minnesota. Thank you. Senator Muhammad. Oh, okay. Um, Senator Mann on the bill. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I ask for your support today, um, and I will just say that this bill has been around for 10 years and has not passed because some people in this body believe that the status quo is okay. They believe that 24% of people having access to paid leave is adequate. Um, they believe that the free market should take care of the problem. Well, that's what we have now. We have a free market now. People can opt in. They can buy disability insurance. They can provide this benefit to people. 24% of people have this product. It is not working. And to say um, that I have not been willing to look at other ideas is not only inaccurate, but it is quite frankly offensive. Not only have I looked at what other countries have done, I looked at what every single other state have done. I also got my master's degree in public health and my final project was on paid family leave. So trust me when I know that I have done the research. And specifically, I have looked at the Republican proposal, which would cover only workers lucky enough to have employers who buy the program, who would not cover your own medical um, serious condition, who, because the insurance company would get to choose who would get benefits or not, that is where those inequalities and those discretion is where those inequalities lies. So we could discriminate based on anything that we choose to. There is no requirement to cover workers. There is no protection for losing your job. And the cost will be likely at least twice as much, if not more, than a public program. And we know that because we saw that happen in Connecticut, where their costs administratively are 15% versus 7 in our bill. Now, <clears throat> it was also said we already have employers who do this. They offer six weeks of full pay. We don't separate dogs from their mothers before eight weeks. But when it comes to humans, we're like, two weeks, get back to work. What are we doing? That doesn't help. And a tax credit once a year for 25% of your paycheck also does not help. It does not get to what we are trying to get here. And to say that other states are, are, are failing, they are not, right? Four states decreased their premiums in the last year. Washington did not double their premium. They went from 0.6 to 0.8 because they started in COVID and they had to make up for that. And so there's a lot of misconception, a lot of uh, non-factual information going around on what this bill does and does not do. And I'm here to guarantee you that this program is proven, it is durable, it is popular, and it works. And so I urge your support today. Thank you. Senator Murphy moves that Senate File 2, as amended, be recommended to pass. On that motion, all those in favor say aye. 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 No, no. Motion prevails. Senator Mann and Ms. Grunwald Nogner and Ms. Doyle Fontaine, thank you for your help on this and thanks for. I think this will provide a very helpful benefit to Minnesotans, and I appreciate it. Senator Murphy, we have one more bill on the agenda today.
the packet members, the packets for House File 36 are being distributed right now, so we done, don't have the overlap of all the documents. Thank you. Hi. Hello. I love the piece of in the white. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no. They, they kind of get, they can get kind of dirty though, too. You can't keep them for forever. Got to keep them crisp though. Senator Murphy. At some point, I'll need to clarify why they're still Okay. See, today's. Senator Murphy, House File 36, Worker Safety Requirements. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Chair and members. I am uh, really delighted to be uh, here one more time today uh, with the warehouse worker safety proposal um, that has been uh, moving its way through uh, the Minnesota Senate and the Minnesota House. Uh, this is uh, a bill to protect worker safety in Minnesota's warehouses with a common sense requirement that companies notify warehouse workers of any quotas they're expected to meet and provide their workers with access to their data on how they're performing those quotas. We know uh, many industries are uh, industries where people can get hurt in their work. It's true in nursing, uh, it's true in farming, uh, and it's true in our warehouses. Uh, it is the case that uh, uh, this work is becoming much more automated uh, and successfully automated, which is something that I think Minnesotans value. But the, the result of that is that there are Minnesotans who work in our warehouses that are experiencing more workplace injuries. And the goal of this proposal is to make sure that the, the workers who work in our warehouses uh, understand the, the expectations of them, um, the quotas that they need to meet, that they have access to that data, um, so that they're able to meet that quota and that we have the means to investigate if the rate of injury in a facility is 30% uh, above uh, the mean here in the state of Minnesota. The bill really does uh, a few things. It requires warehouse companies to no notify their workers of any quotas they'll be disciplined or fired if they fail to meet. And it allows the workers to request access to that performance data it protects workers against legal, or it protects workers' existing legal rights by ensuring any quota or performance standard won't interfere with that worker's legal rights to take a break for meals, to use the restroom, and to pray. It gives the Department of Labor and Industry the ability to enforce the provisions and to open up an investigation into any company with injury rates higher than 30% above the average for warehouses into violations of the provision, and it ensures that workers have the power to enforce those provisions. The legislation will ensure warehouse workers have the information they need to keep themselves and their coworkers safe. I will also say that this is uh, the product of a lot of negotiation. We have been in the Labor Committee to the Judiciary Committee, back to the Labor Committee for a second hearing with amendments, and we are before you today with one more amendment. Um, I want to give credit uh, to the people with whom I have been working. I have had uh, an exhaustive tour. Um, at the Amazon warehouse in Shakopee, uh, where I actually did some packaging, um, among other things, and I hope the package was safely delivered. I'm sure that it was. Um, and I want to thank um, Bruce Newstead from the retailers, who has been incredibly patient um, and persistent. And we have accepted many changes in this proposal um, over the many hearings, um, including one more today. Um, and with that, Mr. Chair, I believe there is an amendment in your packet. Um, yes, there it would is. be great and to do that and talk about the Senator bill. Murphy, we're working off the House File 36 language, which you said is fine, and you have the A1 amendment to that amendment. Um, Senator Muhammad moves the A1 amendment to the amendment, uh, to the House File 36. Um, and again, the, as a technical amendment, you're, okay. um, is there any discussion on the A1 amendment? If, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was wondering if Senator Murphy could explain the amendment and what's the rationale behind it. Mr. Chair, Senator Murphy. Uh, this is a, an amendment that has come through the negotiation. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we've been in ongoing negotiations, so we're taking out on line 1.20 or group of employees um, in the definition of employee work speed data. Senator Pratt. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Murphy, I'm wondering why you're making that change on line 1.20. If I go down to uh, line 2.22, you still have the same an employee or group of employees designation. Help me understand why we're deleting it in one place and keeping it in another. Mr. Chair and Senator Pratt, we're keeping um, group of employees uh, in the bill because there are uh, examples uh, when group quotas are used, and we think that it's important to uh, to note that. I'm sorry, I group couldn't hear you. I was, it was, could you move a little closer? Senator Dames, <laughs> it's not Senator Dames, it's Senator Anderson that's always asking me to move closer to the microphone. Um, we are keeping group of employees in the bill on line two because there are examples, there are times in which group quotas are employed uh, in warehouses. Further discussion on the A1 amendment? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Motion prevails. On House File 36, um, Mr. Olofsson, you're going to go through fiscal going um, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, for the record, my name is Eric Olofsson, fiscal analyst for the Senate Labor Committee. Uh, in your packets, you should find a fiscal note uh, for Senate File 58's uh, second engrossment. This perfectly matches the fiscal note for House File 36. There was a slight rounding error. Uh, this fiscal note was revised in time while the House File had not yet been revised. So that's why we're using this fiscal note in front of us, but it perfectly matches the House File fiscal note. Um, so moving on to page, I'd like to start on page two of the fiscal note. Uh, just look at, uh, for members, all of this is dealing with the workers' compensation fund. Um, so for fiscal year 24, it's anticipating a cost of 116,000 and then 91,000 each year thereafter in expenditures from the workers' compensation fund. And then also for anticipated revenues uh, towards the, this is from penalty revenue from citations, it's anticipating $13,000 to the workers' compensation fund each year. So just to go over the basic, uh, moving on to page three of the fiscal note, just to go through their overall assumptions. Uh, section one of the bill adds additional investigatory and enforcement authority to Minnesota OSHA. Um, and based on the data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, there are a total of 71 warehouse distribution centers that meet uh, the criteria of having 250 or more workers uh, in Minnesota or, and categorized in the five uh, North American industry classification systems listed in the bill. Um, uh, so overall, uh, the bill uh, will require Minnesota OSHA to evaluate these 71 distribution centers, and that will require in the first, in fiscal year 24, a half FTE to uh, establish parameters, document and review the process, perform follow-up assessments of employers and reconcile multiple sets of data, and then uh, a quarter FTE will be needed to maintain and prepare these evaluations each year thereafter. Um, and based on the professional judgment, Minnesota OSHA also anticipates that 40% of the 71 covered uh, distribution centers or employers will have an employee incidence rate of at least 30% higher than the year's average incidence rate. Uh, so for these additional, uh, and that results in 28 additional Minnesota enforcement inspections. And so that will require, uh, Minnesota, Min OSHA estimates that they will need a half FTE safety investigator uh, to complete these 28 enforcement inspections annually. Um, and then based off, so then just looking at the overall expenditure tables, I'm looking at the very bottom table on page four, uh, just for these FTEs, they're anticipating approximately uh, and I'm looking at the cumulative expenditures, the very last row on page four. So it's approximately 116,000 from the workers' compensation fund in 2024, and then the 91,000 ongoing, as I mentioned before. And then looking at the page five of the fiscal note includes the estimated uh, penalty revenue from enf enforcement action of the 13,000 towards the workers' compensation fund per fiscal year. And with that, that concludes my walk through the fiscal note, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Questions from the committee? Senator Jahan. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I'm just reading over the language of the bill and 
Um, starting on 329, uh, you know, I, I, I understand what you're trying to get at. Senator Murphy and, and what your goal is, and, and I don't have a problem with what you're trying to do and what goal you're trying to have. But as an employer, I, I look at this, and, and a lot of times there are other reasons you let an employee go, and any reason, the way I read that, I would have to provide this data, even if the person was caught stealing or using drugs or some other late all the time, leaving early, whatever the reason is. Um, so I, I, can you just explain why why we have to do that? And I don't have a warehouse, so I, <laughs> it's not for me. But um, why I would have to give them those reports when it isn't pertaining to the reason they were let go. Senator Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Senator Dreheim, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, we believe the employees should have access to the reasons, um, but I also understand and we have been talking with the retailers about uh, whether or not we can uh, refine this a little bit to make sure in a situation like you're describing um, that, that that employee would not necessarily qualify. So we are actually still working on this. Thank you, Senator Murphy. I, I you know, because if it comes to the floor like this, I will have an amendment to try to do some different language with that. I mean, I, I can see if it is a production that you might want to request this, but if it's not production related, then then I think it's a undue burden for um, the employer, um, or maybe it, if requested, or, or some other language we could put in there. Um, so that's a hint that you might see an amendment <laughs> coming if it isn't fixed by the time it hits the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Dryham, for the hint. I appreciate that. Senator Pratt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, see, uh, I see Commissioner Blissenbach here. I was wondering if I could ask her a question. Commissioner, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Welcome, Commissioner Bilsenbach. I'm, I'm curious. It looks like the funding of this is coming out of the Workers' Compensation Fund. I'm curious what the tie-in is to uh, performance measurement tracking uh, to worker comp. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt, uh, thank you for the question. So the OSHA program, so enforcement authority under this bill is given to the OSHA program. The state funding for the OSHA program does come from the work comp fund. And the reason for that is because the OSHA standards and, and rules that are enforced by Minnesota OSHA are supposed to have the effect of reducing workplace injury and illnesses. Um, and that is the, the goal of this bill as well. Um, so by having the OSHA enforcement, we um, hope to see a corresponding decrease in injury and illness rates, which will have a positive effect on the workers' compensation system. Commissioner Blissenbach, can you identify yourself for the record? Oh. Yes, Mr. Chair, my name is Nicole Blissenbach, and I'm the Commissioner of the Department of Labor and Industry. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Commissioner, if, if I'm given a goal, it doesn't necessarily result in an injury or illness, right? I mean, it, and just to take it aside, right, if, uh, if I'm a, a salesperson, I may have a sales quota. If I am a warehouse worker and I've been out to Amazon, I may have, you know, so many packages per hour, which may not result in a workforce injury, but could result in my performance review. And I'm still having a hard time understanding that we are not talking specifically about uh, goals, quotas, requirements that are specifically tied to injury. We're talking just about workplace expectations. and and. Again, help me understand. We can we can say generally that it's being enforced by OSHA from a workforce safety, but I'm I'm still struggling to make that connection. Commissioner or Senator Murphy, whoever wants to go ahead. You can go ahead. 
Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Pratt. I, um, I imagine uh, that you have been uh, to the warehouse in Shakopee, though I'm not certain. Um, and as I, I mentioned in my opening remarks, uh, there are uh, absolutely uh, occupations uh, that are less safe than others. I come from one, nursing. And the legislature, I think back in 2008, um, acted to uh, create the safe patient handling legislation because we recognized as a, a group of policymakers that the injury rate was too high. Um, we see that same phenomenon happening in warehouses and Amazon um, is among the highest rate of injury and that rate of injury um, with new data from 2020, 2021, we've seen that injuries have risen by 10%. Um, they're up already and they continue to rise. And what I observed when I was there was, you know, uh, it was a well uh, choreographed facility in that everybody was doing their thing. Um, but it is a repetitive, fast-paced uh, execution of work. And it is because of that that people are experiencing higher rates of injury. Um, and the quota, and meeting a quota, um, is contributing to that. Um, and we had people come and testify in the Labor Committee. Um, and this is another piece of legislation that has been um, the, the work of a number of years. Um, they have come and testified about not understanding the quota, being in a position of uh, p potential discharge or firing uh, because of not understanding that, but also of workplace, workplace injury. So the tie really is between the automation, the expectation to meet a quota uh, that is resulting in some phys in increased injuries in the workplace. Um, and we believe that, as uh, the commissioner has said, uh, that by creating uh, the means to investigate, which OSHA doesn't have right now, um, and by uh, making sure that workers understand what the quota is, what their expectation is, that we will inc improve on worker safety, um, and that will improve uh, for both the workers and, I would imagine, for Amazon. Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just would add one piece, which is there are many OSHA standards that are have a direct tie, you know, fall protection, direct tie to workplace safety. But there are many OSHA standards that um, we know have an impact on injury and illness rates, but they're not as direct of a tie as fall protection. And many of those include training. Um, so we know that knowledge by workers has, has a positive impact on those injury and illness rates. And that's, I think, what the intent of this bill is really getting at is knowledge, imparting that knowledge so workers know what they're expected or what's expected of them, and they are able to use that in, in making the decisions that they make, which will have an impact on safety. Sir Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I've, I've been out to the Amazon facility several times, and I had hoped to go with you that day. Unfortunately, I had a family emergency I had to take care of. But, um, and it seems like, you know, as, as I recall the, the facility, there's a, a central spot where, you know, every employee has the chance to go and see what their, what their expectations are, how close they are to meeting them. There's a multi-tiered level of intervention in that um, with coaching and counseling before we get to any sort of uh, termination. If there were a complaint that was not tied to illness or injury, and I see in, in um, uh, subdivision six, on page four, um, it says the uh, the agency shall, um, I'm trying to remember where it was. I thought it was shall investigate. Maybe it was, uh, anyway, uh, th there was a requirement to sh that you shall investigate versus may investigate. My, my question to that is, if there's a complaint based upon the um, th that doesn't result in illness or injury, why would OSHA be required to investigate those those complaints? Commissioner. 
Mr. Chair and Senator Pratt, um, the, that happens often uh, where an OSHA standard is not being followed and OSHA receives a complaint um, and it didn't necessarily uh, result in an injury or illness. Uh, we try to be as proactive as possible in OSHA enforcement and if we um, are made aware of a violation that's happening, it's better for us to be out and addressing that before we have a corresponding injury or illness. Further discussion, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Commissioner, I'm, I'm just kind of curious again. So um, let's say a complaint comes in and your OSHA investigator decides that it doesn't meet the threshold or it doesn't meet the criteria. Doesn't the shall investigate put a, uh, an additional stretch on your, on your uh, staff versus uh, being able to say that this is a claim without merit? Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt, um, if I am hearing the question correct, I think the we often have emphasis programs in OSHA and they're a direct result of higher injury and illness rates in certain industries. Um, and I believe that that is what the goal is when we have the shall investigate the, um, the employers that are over that 30% rate, if that's um, where you're where you're asking the question from. But that that is uh, also a common thing that we do at Minnesota OSHA is we try to identify the industries that are having those higher injury and illness rates and devote resources to those so that we can have that proactive effect rather than um, waiting until there are injuries and illnesses to respond to. Senator, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I certainly understand having areas of emphasis at concerns me when it's written in statute. Um, you know, certainly your, your department has the latitude to find areas of emphasis, to find areas where you're seeing trends that, that lead to higher injury rates and putting additional focus on that. It's a different thing to, to actually write that mandate into statute, and I guess that's the concern that I'm trying to, to bring forth. Thank you. Senator Dames. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Murphy. Can you tell me, uh, with the money coming out of the appropriation coming out of the Workers' Compensation Fund, can you tell me, Senator Murphy, what position has the Minnesota Workers' Compensation Council taken on taking the funds out of there for this? Commissioner? Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Dames, um, the funding out of the Workers' Compensation Fund uh, is not an area that would typically go in front of the Workers' Compensation Advisory Council. Thank you. Further discussion, Senator Muhammad. Um, thank you, Senator Murphy, for bringing this bill forward. Um, this is um, an issue that I heard a lot about over the past few years. Um, particularly from my own community. I think 60% of the employees that work in the Shaakipi Amazon warehouse are East Africans. And um, we have the first labor union group um, that just came out of that because those employees have been struggling for a long time. Um, and why I like this bill so much is I think one of the things that is a requirement is um, requiring employees to not meet um, a certain quota um, if they cannot, if they're not allowed, if they're not able to eat and or pray. Um, and so I just really appreciate you for bringing this forward. I can't tell you the amount of times I've heard about folks coming to me and being like, I went and I had to take some time off. I had a, I had a woman come to me and said she had uh, cancer and took some time off, came back to work a few months later and was told you're not working fast enough and then would not eat and or would not pray. And so um, some of the things that, are, that we're hearing a lot from the workers is, is unacceptable. And often I feel like with the conversations we had around paid medical family leave and this, I get a little disappointed because we forget that there is a power dynamic between the employee and the employer. And so just thank you for bringing it forward. I'm excited to vote for it. Senator Dreheim. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and, and, and thank you, Senator Murphy, for, for your work on this. Um, you know, my, my only other concern 
is when it would be enacted. And I, I think pushing it out to January 1 or, or something to give people time to get organized and to communicate with their employers would would be reasonable. Um, you know, just a few months for, for the industries to, to get ready. Um, but I, I, I do support the effort of what you're trying to accomplish, but I, I do think we need to just push it out a couple months. You know, so we're done here in May. I assume the way it's drafted, it would be July 1 or August 1. July 1, is that? August. Mr. Chair, August. August 1. Default, uh, default effective date is August 1 if we don't specify. Okay, so August 1. Um, you know, I, I, I think just pushing out to January 1 would be a, a reasonable request. So that, that's what my thoughts are. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Murphy, any further, dis oh, um, any further comments on the bill? Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I, um, I really appreciated Senator Muhammad's uh, comments. Uh, we heard, especially in the bill's first hearing in the Labor Committee, uh, a lot of testimony uh, from um, members, uh, workers, uh, particularly at Amazon, um, and about the pressure that they feel. Um, language barriers contribute to that, of course. Um, I do think that this is an important piece of legislation. Um, we have refined it significantly in terms of um, the warehouses that would be impacted. We've made that more narrow. We've, we've refined the definitions. We have raised the number of employees in the proposal. Um, working with uh, people who had concerns at the beginning in order to get it right. Uh, we would not be the first state to put this in place. Um, California, New York, I believe Illinois is working on this now. Uh, and so we've, we've been working along with the retailers and with Amazon um, to make sure that we are doing what we believe is right, what I believe is right, what we believe is right for Minnesota workers, understanding that um, what we do here impacts other places. And I think we found the balance in that. I appreciate the feedback. Uh, and the hints, uh, and hope to earn your support today. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for taking time. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I, Senator had my, I had my hand up before you called on Senator Murphy. So, sure. Um, you know, I want to uh, just touch on the, the comments that Senator Muhammad made as well. I, is, uh, as former chair of the Jobs Committee, it was always my intention to balance the rights and the needs of the employer and the employee, recognizing that we have uh, a codependent relationship. And my fear is that we are kind of breaking that. I certainly want employees to be safe at work. Um, there's a number of bills that we've had this year, and some of them I voted for, that, that go directly to that. Um, I'm not making as strong a connection, I guess, having been out to Amazon and, and uh, not saying that not seeing a direct correlation between the quotas and workplace injuries when there are other areas of workplace injury that that could be occurring other than just performance standards. Um, I will also say, and, and to Senator Dreheim's point, having passed and implemented a really big bill, right, with, with major impact. Um, that the implementation time that we had for wage theft was way too short. It caused a lot of confusion. It caused a lot of angst. Um, and I would, Senator Murphy, before this gets to the floor, I would uh, ask you to consider pushing that date out to about January. Because you said you've, been, you've worked with Amazon and, and the retailers, and, and I can tell you that they've reached out to me to say they still have significant concerns over this bill. And one of them is, in fact, implementation, that uh, in order to comply with the changes here um, would be difficult, if not impossible, within two months. I also want to just say to Senator Dame's point, we have a a, a long-standing um, lack of a better term requirement that changes to the work comp funding go through the work comp advisory board. 
Um, Senator Miller and I, when we were doing preemption during COVID, worked very closely with that board and the stakeholders on that board because it, it is uh, it is an important area where we get that balance between employers and employees to find, but also, quite honestly, to make sure that we have the resources available to pay claims and, and, and make sure that the system operates. I just look back at the jobs and labor spreadsheet. We took a 20% increase just in operating out of the work comp fund, and now we're taking another 115000 which would probably kick that up north of 20%. And it's disappointing to hear that it, this has not been reviewed, been weighed in on by the very people that we've appointed as uh, advisors, gatekeepers on that fund to make sure that uh, it is healthy enough to pay out the obligations that we've statutorily put on it. Obligations that working Minnesotans who are in fact worked at, injured at work um, can, can pull down to make sure that their family and their medical bills are covered and uh, while they're while they're out of work recovering so uh, I have concerns just over how much we've been dipping into that fund supplementing what's been used out of general fund uh, to keep it off the target it quite honestly during the you may recall during the review of the jobs and labor bill I, I called it an accounting gimmick at the time and I still think it's an accounting gimmick so uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I think there's a lot more work to be done on this bill. I don't think this is ready for the floor. Uh, as Senator Murphy says, she's, you know, she's continuing to work with stakeholders, but um, I would rather see her complete that work before we pass this out to the, uh, for, a, for a vote by the, by the entire body, and so I'll be opposing the bill today. And Senator Pratt, on the, your comment, I, I actually think this will be savings for the workers' comp fund because there will be fewer injuries. And when some of these warehouses have, I think, multiple times the um, injury rate as one other warehouses and certainly more than other employers, I, I think addressing this in a proactive way is a savings to the workers' comp fund. But, um, Senator Muhammad. Um, Mr. President, I appreciate Senator Pratt's um, perspective and Senator Draham's perspective in wanting to push this back. Um, but I really would love it if we moved um, with some urgency to protect our workers. You know? Um, I feel like we forget the fact that a company like Amazon, they have so much money. They make record profits off of, the, off of the backs of the people who are coming to us and are saying, we are struggling. I can't even pray in my workplace. I can't even eat. If I don't make this, if, I don't, if I'm not at this speed limit, I'm going to be fired. My mother worked at a warehouse. Yeah, I know. I can do it. I never got to see her growing up because she'd have to stay work late to be able to make sure that she met these quotas. And she was protected because she was in a union. And I just, I cannot believe we sit here and we say, let's give uh, a really wealthy company five more months to figure it out when they've had years, decades to figure it out. Why would we do that? Our job as legislators is to look out for the people of Minnesota and the workers, not for the wealthy companies who are abusing our workers. Senator Drehan. Thank you. Um, and thank you for your comments, Senator Mohammed. And, and, and just, you know, I, I, as a business owner, we try to protect our employees, have the safest environment for the employees we can. We try to train our employees on the proper way to do different procedures to limit the risk on getting hurt. Um, but we also have a state agency that does respond to workforce injuries and also can advise. And I, in one of my past lives, I did invite OSHA in to tour the uh, facilities I was responsible for so I could learn 
what I could do to help protect my employees. So we do have guidance from the state and federal government on different types of employment, and we do have a great, great labor market where there are jobs available literally down every street across the whole state. So I think waiting a couple months is not that um, unexpected for um, the author to look at just extending it uh, a few months. We do it all the time. Um, and, and, and hopefully the author will take that amendment um, when it comes to the floor, because um, I will offer it. I, I do think it's reasonable. You know, we're done here May. To wait six months is, is reasonable. Um, or is it July 1? I thought it was July 1 that it would be enacted and Mr. not August Chair. 1. Mr. Chair, as uh, we were talking about it, uh, Council uh, leaned over to say because there's an appropriation in the bill, it is not August, it is July. So, so you know, we're, we're given two months' notice for, for industry to, to do it right. I'd rather wait a few months and get it right than rush it and get it wrong. So I just wanted to comment on that. I appreciate everybody's comments. I think we're all in the same um, opinion that we want to do what we can to, to uh, do as much as we can to secure the safety of all Minnesotans. Senator Murphy. Mr. Pratt, Chair. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, no one has said that we don't want our, our workers to be safe. And uh, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned by Senator Muhammad's comments around focusing this bill strictly on Amazon. If that is truly the target that we've got in our headlights, then it's wrong for us to be writing a bill that it, that is intended for one employer. If we have a you know, multi-billion dollar company, as Senator Muhammad said, and, and that's the only one that, that we need to worry about, then this bill is, is misguided. If we have a lot of smaller warehouses along the way and employers that do this type of work, and as I recall, back in about 2015 or 16, there was a proposal to add a warehouse tax, and we all of a sudden saw warehouse employers moving out of the state. I remember two that moved down to Ames. One canceled a, a, a purchase agreement and moved across the river to Wisconsin. Those were jobs that moved out of this out of Minnesota. Um, not all of those employers are multi-billion dollar companies. Most of them don't have the resources that you claim Amazon does. And no one has said that if these, you know, if these employees want to get together and, and join a union that they can't, they don't have the right to join that union. No one's stopping them. So I, I want to, I want to stop the, the, the hyper the hyperbole when we get to this bill and just say that if you know if we're going to be attacking Amazon then then let's let's be honest about that but if it's truly about being broader then let's not use the example of one large employer as reason to beat up on all of the smaller employers that are actually headquarters housed have their families here in this state I'm I, I just I, I'm tired of gaslighting this issue, and, and I think we really just need to, to take a look at what's the impact going to be across the entire industry. And let's do what's right for both sides. Let's make sure both sides' uh, needs and, and, and um, are met. And let's not, get, let's not embed ourselves too much in that employer-employee relationship. And... Um, that's about, that's really it, Mr. Chair. I just felt like the the conversation got way too targeted to one employer um, that wasn't maybe representative of all of the impact that this bill's going to have. 
Senator Murphy moves that House File 36, as amended, be recommended to pass. On that motion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No, no. Motion prevails. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Murphy, thank you. And with that, um, this committee is, our business for the day is completed. We expect to come back later next week to deal with pension bills, apparently. Um, but that would be the next. I don't expect any meetings remaining this week or early next week. And Senator Pappas is looking at me like she wants to remember that there might be bonding stuff in here. So, um, no, okay. You were giving a funny look. Senator Pratt. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I, I, forgot to, I forgot to bring this up during the discussion on paid family medical leave. And back on January 26th in this, in, in this room, I had asked specifically if we could uh, hold off on hearing paid family medical leave until we had a local impact note. Uh, completed. You told me that was a reasonable request. Uh, we heard that bill here today. I'm wondering if Mr. Nauman or someone from LBO can tell me what the status is on that local Please. impact note. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Pratt, I'm pretty good about being able to know when one has been requested. I'm less conversant with when you catch me off the, off the cuff um, on what the status is, although maybe I should have prepared for that one. Um, let me figure that out and I'll get back to you. Mr. Chair. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm disappointed. I thought we had an agreement back on January 26th when you said that the request to hold that, hold off on that hearing was a reasonable request and yet we heard that bill today. It got a little heated. I should have brought that up during the discussion on that bill, but um, I'm just the the reckless nature that the majority is moving in in these spending programs on these big policy changes that are going to affect every Minnesotan and we've talked about the fact that this is going to have a significant impact on our municipal hospitals on our school districts on our city and county governments it was the whole reason we wanted to have the local impact note you co-sign that local impact note with me and here we are moving this bill forward. So, Mr. Chair, since I missed it on finance, I would hope that you would take to your leadership that we should not be hearing this bill on the Senate floor until we get that local impact note back. Mr. Pratt, I, I'm not sure the status of it. We will look into where the status of that is. I think it's helpful to have those notes, um, and I like to have them whenever we possibly can for things where there will be an impact. Um, with that, um, we will look and try and find out where the note is. Um, with that, there being no further discussion, we will be adjourning right now and see you sometime late next week.